Hello and welcome to Follow Me and Die. I'm your host, Larry Hamilton. And on this episode of Roll20 for the Absolute Beginner, we're going to talk about the Create Game features and all the settings available prior to launching your game to begin play. But before we begin, I'd like to mention that I have a Patreon that helps support all my online efforts. I create YouTube videos, podcasts, I write RPG supplements available at DriveThruRPG. I'm a blogger, and I also sell t-shirts with my logo by Satine Phoenix on my Teespring store. You can also help out the channel by using my Amazon affiliate link when you buy stuff on Amazon. There's no additional cost to you, and I get a small fee. All the links are going to be down below in the show notes, so you can check those out later. Of course, i got to do what all the YouTubers say. Please subscribe, like, and tell all your friends. So, I want to walk through actually creating a game from scratch and touch on all the different pieces here so that we have a review. I know I've talked about this in the past in earlier episodes, but I want one that's just about how to create a new game. So, in addition to creating, you can also copy. Let me just go over the copy real quick. Under Settings, you've got Copy. When you choose Copy Game, it copies everything in that game. It'll even copy the name and the tags. And you can change your description of the name. Uh, I don't think that you can change the name once you've created it. So you want to be sure you get your spelling and all that good stuff right before you do it. Your tags, you can add, edit, delete those. Uh, you can also specify the character sheet, what game you're going to play. The sheets by Roll20, I'd recommend you use those because you know that Roll20 is going to keep up with them. Sheets for those same games done by third parties, I don't know how well those are kept up. I know some of the sheets and games that I've played that are community-based sheets aren't updated very often, if at all anymore, so uh, take that with a grain of salt. Um, you can change your character sheet on a game at any point, but if you do, certain fields may lose information switching between sheets, so you have to be real careful with that. So if you're going to change your sheet, you may even want to make a copy of your game before you change the sheet to make sure nothing gets lost in the transition. Uh, so if you choose your character sheet, there may be some other options, and there's two places you can click on that you're ready to create the game. And you can copy the players and the player settings, including their macros if you wish. Any pages you've made, any card decks, your chat log, your journals, your jukebox, and if you've got game forums. And it'll also copy your image and everything. And so that basically you have a total duplicate. Um, one reason to do that is say you've got a lot of good helpful macros in there. You could copy it so that you've got the macros. Maybe keep that as a template to use for other games to save time. Just depends on how you prefer to operate. It also has a note up here that if you want to make a copy what to do and it's got a link do you want to start from scratch instead. So if we click on that it takes us here, which that's the same place we get when we choose create game. So let's choose create game and you see you get to the same spot. You give your name that you want to call it, the tags that you want, when you're ready you create the game. So let's just make a test game and for example let's do D&D 5e since that's really popular when you choose that, it shows you what the sheet's going to look like. Uh, there's no other options on here, but it does tell you a link of the sheet guide. So if you want to take check that out and the compendium, and then you can add stuff from the marketplace uh, if you want to do that. You don't have to, obviously. So when you're ready, just click ready. Then it'll take you to this all familiar screen where you can set your image and content, your chat archive, 
you can create a listing of looking for players. I'd advise you not create the looking for players listing until you actually have the game built and are ready to go. Under settings, you've got your game settings. Of course, you still have copy the game. You can clear the chat archive. Clear chat archive deletes your entire chat archive and it requires you to type confirm before it'll do it. Similarly, delete game requires you to type the word delete and click OK before it'll get rid of it. So let's go to game settings. What we'll see at the top is there are two features that are paid features that are not available to my account because I've got a free account and that would be allowing public access to the game the default is no and the game background image that game background image is what we were fiddling with a couple episodes ago for the image for the game and you notice that the images we created on certain view didn't go all the way to either side I believe that's what that's for allow players to import characters if you've got someone uh, with a paid account and you want to let them import an account from another Roll20 game you can then there's game default settings the page default so all the different maps and pages you make you can set a default that happens every single time for every map so you don't have to think about it so if you always want fog of war enabled and the opacity set and if you had the paid features you'd see the advanced fog of war and the dynamic lighting down here similarly on tokens you can set defaults for everything some of these defaults are specified by the character sheet so I wouldn't go setting defaults because this would control every single game token that you make for every character and every NPC and every monster if you don't want everybody to have the same defaults don't set it but if you want everything to be the same then specify the defaults you want of course they're defaults so you can override them in-game compendium you can have it determined by the character sheet so we chose the 5e character sheet so for a free account you'll have access to the system reference document if you buy the player's handbook the players would have access to that as well uh, or you can specify the game rules you can just let the character sheet pull that in do you want to share your compendium with the players you can choose yes and then there's a compendium sharing slot and then I've already specified the character sheet and then here we've got some options we can fill in on the character sheet and it's going to differ from one character sheet to another so just read through these options and pick the ones that you want I'm not going to take the time to go into that as I mentioned the bar values bar 1 is for hit points and bar 2 is for the armor class if we come back up here to token defaults bar 1 and bar 2 if you would put something in here that would change the default to ignore what's on the character sheet so that's something you want to take into consideration is what is the character sheet doing and are you going to be overriding the character sheet which may break functionality that you would expect um, once you've got everything set you click save changes and then you have to save changes keeps you on this screen so you have to choose home to get back to your game here's our test game we can come here uh, playing you can tell it what game you're playing you can choose a day and time for the next game description save your changes you can use markdown formatting if you don't know what markdown is you can google that basically it's a way to add italics and bold and other formatting to your text game add-ons so you can add different things um, I guess Pathfinder has a playtest flip mat multi-pack or you can add other things that would take you to the marketplace uh, you can post a new topic in your game forum and say welcome you can use the standard controls here to do italics bold and 
underline and all that. Hit post topic and now you've got a topic and we can go back to home and we'll see recent game discussion what we've got here. As I talked in my last episode you can change your default token markers here. Here's where you can invite players. You click the invite, plug in an email address and you send it that way or you can use your share link. Don't try clicking on that link because I'm going to be deleting this game after I uh, finish recording the episode so there won't be anything for you to join here but uh, this will allow you to invite others to join your game and then when you're ready launch your game there we go so now here's a empty game that allows you to do whatever you want with it there's no maps yet because it's brand new there's no other settings there's no macros nothing else well the art will be defined because your art carries through across all your games So that's how you create a game. It's quick and easy, as you saw. Um, you can't hurt anything. Create your free account. Create a game. If you want to make a change, you can go to your game settings and you can change something. And if you decide you want to check out the paid features, get a paid subscription, and you can go for it. So that's all there is to creating a game or copying a game even. Uh, so I hope you found that helpful. If there's something specific about copying or creating a game that you'd like to know, comment down below and either I or the other viewers will be able to comment on that. I hope this has been helpful. Have a great day and game on. When you create a new game, on this screen it's got an option for choosing a module. Up at the top here you've got starter sets and other free content and then down below you've got the marketplace for paid content. What is not so obvious is that if you want a module to be in a campaign you have to create the game and add the module at the time of creation. You cannot add a module to an existing game. The only way that you could get an existing character would be if you have the, uh, I believe, a paid account so that you can move your character sheets between games so that if you have one campaign in a rule system and you move on to the next module in the rules, same rule system with the same characters, you either have to re-enter all the characters or copy them using the copy feature. So that is not real obvious. It took Googling to direct back to the Roll20 forums to find this. So you want to pay attention to that. If you purchase a module, you want to create your game right away and whatnot. And then, of course, like a beginner game that has sample characters, there you go, but if you're going to use your own characters, then you'll have to figure that piece of it out. Related to paid modules, I was advising someone on the getting the Tomb of Annihilation module to show up in their game. That's when we figured out that you have to select it when you're creating the game. A couple of things in the game in the module were not obvious. This individual had watched Adam Koble's Roll20 series of live plays where they had gone through Tomb of Annihilation on Chult. In the Chult player map, you can see so many miles in from the coast is known. But then inside is all hidden by these tan hexagons. Well, it turns out those tan hexagons are actually little graphics for each hex. And you've got a couple different ways you can deal with it. You can uh, delete 
each hexagon or you could send it to the GM layer if you wanted to be able to bring it back for some reason. The other thing that we struggle to figure out is in that series of videos on the Tomb of Annihilation, they had a party icon that was a hexagon with the word party on it and they could advance that as the party moved on the map. And we looked under the tokens and under the module and there is no party token under the compendium that comes with the module. And it's not under the art assets. And it's a little bit tricky. Where on earth is that? It turns out, so in the top left-hand corner of the Chult Players map, there's this information. And this is a screenshot that I've cropped down so they've got these graphics on the map and as you can see it's very light it's very hard to read and I don't think it's just my aging eyes because the default size of the map that's pretty tiny and we missed it uh, he had to give me the game master role in the game so that I could noodle around and I just happened to see it I tried googling for it and the best I could find the most common thing was is somebody deleted the party token and wanted it back. Well there's no way to get it back other than make a new game and copy it out of that game and move it over. So the this tan icon, the two party icons, and this red hexagon icon, those are all individual graphics that you can move. And so my advice is that you make a copy from the icon up here and don't use this icon. Make a copy and even add that to your token so you can't lose it. Um, I don't know. I would suspect that other modules from Wizards of the Coast for D&D 5e will have a similar thing. So now that I know that, it's really easy to answer the question. But just like everything else in life, if you have no experience with it and don't know the answer, it's impossible until you either stumble upon the answer or find someone that knows it. In this case, I stumbled upon the answer. If it's documented in the module, I didn't uh, locate it. I tried searching in the module and uh, it didn't come up with party icon or party graphic. So uh, I'm not sure how you're supposed to find it if you overlook it on the map. Because there's a lot of different maps in the Chult module or the Tomb of Annihilation module. Uh, so uh, I would advise that you uh, look closely at the players' maps of Wizards of the Coast modules and perhaps even the modules of other game companies. I would imagine that uh, this is something that uh, is probably a Roll20 thing to work with Roll20. So maybe they've done that for all such maps like this that Roll20 has helped a game company put out there. I would suggest to Roll20 or whoever came up with this idea that those little icons are cool and all, but you might want to document that it's there so you don't get bombarded with people not being able to figure it out. And it would be a good idea to make those actual graphics in the game. They're not very big. That would be handy. But something that makes it easier for novice players in Roll20 to figure it out because a person with 40 plus years of gaming experience and a physical copy of the book doesn't have those little graphics that I recall. I'll have to look at my book back on the shelf behind me here. Why would somebody who's never used a virtual tabletop and therefore never used Roll20 have any clue that that was there? And I've been using Roll20 for six years now and I didn't know that because I don't have a paid account. And even if I had a paid account, it appears that it would be a challenge for me to figure that out, except for just blindly stumbling upon it. I don't know if Adam Coble in the YouTube video series mentioned where to find those, but I wasn't going to watch hours and hours trying to see if that was revealed or not. One shouldn't have to do that. It should be easier to find something that is so trivial. But I guess... Like a lot of things, when you know something so well, you can't imagine nobody else doesn't know. Uh, so hopefully, you'll find that helpful when you uh, decide to purchase content and want to look for information about that.